Hello, everyone. I am Chris Hyams, CEO of Indeed. My pronouns are he and him, and welcome to the next episode of Here to Help. For accessibility, I'll offer a quick visual description. I'm a middle-aged man with dark-rimmed glasses. I'm wearing a blue T-shirt. Behind me is the uh, North Austin skyline. At Indeed, our mission is to help people get jobs. This is what gets us out of bed in the morning and what keeps us going all day. And what powers that mission is people. Here to Help is a look at how experience, strength, and hope inspires people to want to help others. As most of you likely know, April is Earth Month, a global recognition to foster awareness, support for climate protection. Though lesser known in the U.S., April is also Second Chance Month. First officially observed in 2017, Second Chance Month is a nationwide effort to raise awareness of the collateral consequences of a criminal conviction and unlock second chance opportunities for education, housing, and employment for people who have completed their sentences to become contributing citizens. The awareness effort is led by the Prison Fellowship, the nation's largest nonprofit serving the incarcerated, the formerly incarcerated, and their families, and is an advocate for justice reform. Today's guest is Julia Hatton, the CEO of the Rising Sun Center for Opportunity. Rising Sun is a nonprofit organization in California that prepares low-income youth and adults for good quality careers. Uniquely, Rising Sun does this work through a climate lens, focusing on careers in the clean economy and providing energy solutions to underserved communities. Julia has been with Rising Sun since 2012 and has led the organization through significant growth and impact, becoming CEO of the organization in March of 2020. Since 2000, Rising Sun has prepared over 3,000 youth and adults for careers in energy efficiency, the clean economy, and the union building and construction trades, prioritizing women, youth, and people impacted by the justice system. Rising Sun is a member of the Justice 40 Accelerators inaugural, inaugural cohort and was recently granted the Neighborhood Builders Award. Rising Sun sits at the intersection of Earth Month and Second Chance Month. And in this episode, we'll be discussing the opportunity to address climate resilience and economic mobility simultaneously and the challenges and imperatives of building a more equitable green economy. We'll also explore Julia's personal journey and what drives her commitment to social and environmental justice. Julia, thank you so much for joining me today. So wonderful to be here. Thanks for having me, Chris. Let's start where we always start these conversations. How are you doing uh, this morning right now? I'm, I'm good. I'm here. I'm awake. I've had my coffee. So <laughs> that's all I can ask for at this point. I'm, do I'm doing well. How about you? I'm doing great. I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Um, so let's dive right in. Can you start by just telling us a little about the mission and work of Rising Sun, how, how the organization came to be, and what are some of the things that um, you're most proud of that you've accomplished to date? Yeah, yeah. Well, we have we have some alignment in our missions. Um, Rising Sun's a nonprofit um, organization. We're focused on workforce development and climate change and, and sort of where those things intersect. And we're in the California Bay Area. We have offices in Oakland and Stockton and ultimately cover a 10-county 10, 10 region. And all the people and communities we work with are considered low income, and most have things going on in their lives that make it hard to get a job or to keep a job. So we're all about breaking those barriers uh, to employment. And we've, we've actually been around since 1994, um, but our origin story um, really begins in Berkeley in 2000 when we had staff who were teaching a class on climate change at Berkeley High. And it was the students in that class who decided that they didn't want to just learn about how climate change was affecting their communities. They wanted to go out and, and do something about it, you know, as, as youth are wont to do. So they, they started going to their family and friends' houses and taking out their old and efficient lighting and replacing it with, um, with new bulbs that saved energy. So that was sort of the beginning of everything. And then... Um, then it was 2009, which was um, the days of the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act. And so there was a lot going on at that time around green jobs. Uh, we started offering job training for adults at that time. 
and we're preparing people to work in residential energy efficiency, weatherization, solar, sort of your traditional green jobs, right? Um, but pretty quickly, we found that those jobs weren't offering good wages, benefits, safety protection, and career advancement. And, and because of that, green jobs were keeping people in poverty. And that was, that was sort of the antithesis of, of our mission, right? Um, so in 2014, we switched up our adult program. We became a pre-apprenticeship for the union building and construction trades, um, and the built environment uh, generates about 40% of global CO2 emissions. The construction industry is really at the forefront, especially in California, of building a more sustainable future. They're really building the climate uh, resilient infrastructure that, that we need. Um, and on the other side of things, unions also offer sort of the gold standard for, for job quality and economic mobility. And they don't require a college degree they don't discriminate against system, system impacted folks. Um, and we saw a need for increasing representation of women in the trades. So we decided to prioritize women in our, our pre-apprenticeship. So that leads us to today. <laughs> uh, we have two main programs that we run, Climate Careers and Opportunity Build. Um, and I'll, I'll briefly describe each just for so we have some context for the rest of the conversation. But um, Climate Careers trains and employs youth ages 15 to 22 as energy specialists, and they provide these free energy efficiency and water conservation services or greenhouse calls to homes in their own communities. And then we place those youth in paid externships with other organizations doing climate work to give them that additional career exposure. And then Opportunity Build, like I mentioned, um, is a certified pre-apprenticeship for adults uh, 18 and up. Uh, we have three cohorts a year, uh, including one of the only all-women construction pre-apprenticeship programs in the country. They are here today. They're uh, doing their physical education uh, training right now. Um, and our graduates get hands-on training, classroom instruction, case management support, mental health and substance use disorder counseling, job placement support, both during the 11-week training and then 12 months after graduation. And so um, the last thing that we do is we're trying to get more into the policy advocacy space because because what really needs to happen, right, to address the things that we'll probably talk about today is, is systems change. That's the piece that we're getting into next. I think most people would uh, agree with the concept that we have an urgent need for more sustainable energy solutions. But can you talk about that need specifically in low income communities and and in particular why in California this is so pressing? Yeah, yeah. And I, I, I think you're right. I mean, I think it's, um, it's a global issue. Um, there's no sector of our economy, no person on this earth who's not going to be impacted or isn't already being impacted by climate change. Um, in California, uh, we're specifically dealing with things like sea level rise, uh, drought, or when there isn't drought, paradoxically flooding, um, wildfires, uh, extreme heat, and our infrastructure really just isn't ready um, to deal with all of those things. And, and our residents aren't either, especially, especially like you're saying, in, um, in communities that have been historically and persistently underinvested, ignored, or intentionally placed at a disadvantage, right? Um, so you can think of, um, you know, maybe their homes are uninsulated and overcrowded. Maybe they've got limited access uh, to clean water. Um, maybe their the air is polluted, their health burdens are greater. Um, maybe their power gets shut off more often and at the same time their energy bills are higher, right? And, you know, maybe they don't have the economic resources or even, even the privilege of time to, to deal with all of those things. Um, I, don't, I don't think those things are unique to California. Um, but these tend to be uh, communities where the household income is insufficient um, and disproportionately they're communities of color. Um, and so this is who is hit first and worst by climate change every single time. And that's because of decades of racist policies and discrimination. Ironically, these, um, these same folks likely have a smaller carbon footprint than higher income households because they're 
they're consuming less, <laughs> um, but they disproportionately bear the burden of those who have a bigger footprint. You know, I think it's also really important to remember in this work that that these impacted communities, uh, which we often label as disadvantaged, um, they have the solutions that our world needs. They're the people who are most impacted um, by a problem are the experts on how to fix it. And that's, I hope, I hope a perspective that's that's starting to change. You had, had mentioned in particular um, the type of uh, jobs are potentially uh, more available to folks who've been justice impacted. And um, I'd love to talk a little bit about how Rising Sun's work supports individuals uh, who may be seeking a second chance, formerly incarcerated folks um, through job training, access to clean energy, or any other means. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I mean, I think when you look at our justice system and the folks who are coming out of it, I don't think our country does a great job of really truly providing second chances. chances. I don't know that we, the extent to which we really believe in second chances. Um, and you see that in the barriers that we put up for people who are coming home. You know, it's just, it's like a second incarceration. It's just more punishment, right? Um, and about 40% of our Opportunity Build participants are system impacted. Um, we started focusing on, on and prioritizing system impacted folks in about uh, 2014, right around when we started our pre-apprenticeship. And that's because um, I think a union construction career really, really does offer a second chance um, in that they don't discriminate against folks who've done their time and just want an opportunity. Um, and then, you know, the, the second part of that is then helping people access those opportunities. And that's, that's the part we do at Rising Sun, right? So a uh, pre certified pre-apprenticeship like Opportunity Build um, gives these folks access to these opportunities the trades can be hard to navigate. We have 28 building trades affiliates in our in like one county alone where we're at. Um, so you need sort of like that transparency, that access. And then we also build foundational skills. We do the employer introductions. Um, and then you have all of the wraparound supportive services, which can include referrals to legal, legal aid and other resources like that. And um, we're super lucky to have um, a senior staff member and a board member who are both graduates of Opportunity Build, um, who came to Rising Sun right after they came home. Um, and our impact is is greater because of them. We're we're better because of them. I'm better because of them. So um, that's that's the perspective I'll share on that. I'm thinking back to the conversation we had last week in in getting ready for this, and and one of the phrases, and I, I spent a lot of time thinking about um, jobs and opportunity in careers, but I had not heard this phrase that, that you used to talk about specifically the type of opportunities that you want to create with Rising Sun, which you call high road opportunities. Can you share with other folks that may, like me, have not heard that before? What what do you mean by that? And and what does that mean for Rising Sun? So the high road is, um, is, a, is a good job, a quality job. Um, union jobs are the gold standard for the high road, but it really can be any job that provides good wages, benefits, career advancement opportunities, worker protections, and opportunities for worker voice, right? And um, I like to say it's it's one that you don't just survive on, but it's a job that you can really thrive on, which is, I think, something that we all deserve but isn't really available to everyone, um, and on the employer side, um, high road employers compete based on the quality of their services and their products, right? So not just being the cheapest and they invest in their people in the long term. And I think, you know, like, I think if your business model only works, if you pay people the minimum, maybe it's time for a better business model, you know, <laughs> like we can, we can, we can do better than that. We can be more creative. So um, in, in California, there are formal partnerships that are focused on um, specific industries that work to build the high road and deliver equity, uh, sustainability, and job quality simultaneously. And that's uh, to the credit of California's Workforce Development Board. And Rising Sun actually leads one of those partnerships um, specifically for, I'm going to get real jargony, 
the um, the residential decarbonization and electrification sector. Um, so basically converting uh, from gas to electric uh, sources of energy. Um, and at the end of the day, we believe that that climate investments um, should deliver both economic and environmental benefits. And, and one way to do that that we're exploring in our HRTP is um, by tying workforce standards to those investments. Um, and an example of where you see that would be in like the uh, Inflation Reduction Act that got passed at the federal level this year. In the climate space, we talk about sustainability, but, but at Indeed, we talk about sustainable jobs and careers. And there's a difference between subsistence and something that actually, and so I, I love that that intersection of of uh, of thinking about uh, economic sustainability, um, and and so in particular, you know, one of the things that that you all do, you, you mentioned the phrase workforce development. So it rising sun is a lot more than just training. Can you talk about what workforce development really means? Yeah, I should. I, I probably should have started with that. Um, yeah, so it's the training that's absolutely part of it. Um, but, but like you're saying, there's a lot more to it than that. Um, and especially, you know, the people we work with are, are facing some pretty high barriers to employment. So, you know, maybe they've been incarcerated. They might be a single parent without childcare. They may have housing insecurity. They have, might have all of those things happening in their life at once, right? Um, so they have things in their lives that, that make it hard to get a job and, and then most importantly, to, to keep a job, right, and to grow in that job. Um, so good workforce development addresses all of that and serves the whole person. Some examples of that would be an opportunity build. We have uh, wraparound supportive services. We have case management. We provide stipends. There's mental health and substance use disorder counseling. There's job placement and retention support. We're going to have those child care stipends soon. And that's during the training but also for 12 months after graduation, because that's when it gets really tough. <laughs> um, and all of that is then paired with the 280 hours of training we provide, which includes the hands-on construction, OSHA 10, uh, first aid certification, site visits, applied math, soft skills, physical training like they're out doing right now. Um, so our, our folks are ready <laughs> for a high road career when they graduate, right? Um, and, uh, that's how we approach workforce development. You know, April being both second chance month and, and earth month. And, and there is a, an intersection between those. And can you talk about, um, about some of these opportunities for, for addressing both of these challenges at the same time? Yeah. Yeah. I think, um, the, the connection between those two things is not immediately apparent, but uh, climate touches everything. <laughs> um, so, you know, there's a couple, a uh, few ways that uh, you can think of these things as, as overlapping. So, so one is that you cannot be climate resilient without economic security. Setting up solar and battery storage might not be first on your list if you're trying to figure out how to afford your medication or, you know, you have to own your home or have a place to sleep, right, for that matter. And I think, um, you know, as your, as your last guest discussed, um, system impacted people face incredible employment barriers when they come home, which then leads to economic security. So all of that is exacerbated. Another way to think about it is, you know, if you think about prisons, uh, many do not have air conditioning. Many are overcrowded. We have more and more and more extreme heat days every single year. I mean, that that's truly hell. It's, it's, it's killing people. <laughs> um, and, and nobody, nobody deserves that. So, you know, I think the thing is that <clears throat> over and over and over again, uh, we see low-income BIPOC communities hit first and worst by these things like mass incarceration, climate change, um, the health, economic, social, and environmental impacts hit them disproportionately. And that's, that's the system that we're operating in and which, which many people have chosen to accept or ignore or perpetuate, right? Um, so <clears throat> instead, I think um, we can give people access to career opportunities they've been excluded from, 
We can deliver on the triple win promise of a green job, so people, planet, and prosperity. And we can at least start to address uh, some of these intersectional connected issues together. There's definitely uh, reality and perception about the fact that adopting uh, some of these uh, greener practices it is more burdensome, that organic produce costs more than non-organic produce and um, and upgrading you know your your home to be more green with double paned windows is is more expensive. Um, can you talk a little bit about some of the the challenges and barriers that communities face in in adopting these solutions and and how you're working to address those barriers? There are real economic barriers to access and adoption of these solutions. EVs aren't cheap. You need a home to install solar. You also need a stable roof and an updated service panel. And programs can be seriously overly complicated to apply for. Um, requirements like proof of income, landlord permission, upfront payments, those are all barriers for low-income uh, families. And I was um, I was talking to some folks last week actually about um, how we have so many great programs in California, but we also have so many great <laughs> programs. There's so many of them. And I mean, I'm in this work and I, I can't keep them all straight. And, you know, how are people supposed to navigate that? Um, so we need we need things to be easier and, and simpler. Um, and I think that all comes down to, uh, do you want people to benefit from these programs or not? We're overly concerned that people will cheat the system. And, and I, I think there's also a subtext there, a lack of trust of low-income folks and BIPOC communities. Um, so that's one thing. Um, but, you know, worst case scenario, a handful of people get some free stuff that they probably could have paid for. That still means progress towards our energy goals, right? So, uh, you know, I think, again, we just need to... <laughs> sort of get out of our own way and uh, stop putting up all these barriers and then being surprised when programs go underutilized. It is an issue um, that we're raising awareness of and that a lot of great folks are working on. And, and, and at Rising Sun, um, we've intentionally designed the greenhouse call for uh, that our youth employees provide to residents to be barrierless, right? So we do massive on the ground outreach it's free. Everyone is eligible. Um, outreach is targeted. You don't need landlord permission. You don't have to prove your income. And we end up really effectively serving our priority communities and making progress on climate goals as well. So it, 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 does, it does work. I'm here to tell you that it works. Organizations like yours and um, and and uh, government institutions can, can play a big role in this. But what what is the role that individuals and communities should play in uh, addressing environmental challenges, and what type of what type of meaningful actions uh, can people take to help create a more sustainable future? You know, I think there's been um, this deflection onto individuals away from from those most responsible, like the fossil fuel industry, for example, and. Um, away from sectors with the greatest emission sources like transportation and buildings. And I think, you know, I, I think at this point, we all know what we can do at the individual level, um, what we can all do differently. And, and a lot of folks are doing it. Uh, it's not a new issue. You know, recycle, ride your bike, take shorter showers, turn the lights off when you're not using them. Um, those are all meaningful actions and, and let's keep doing them. We need to keep doing them. We should keep doing them. Um, but I think we also need to think and act bigger. Uh, we need to change some things that require a major paradigm shift and maybe a power shift. And, and that's not easy. Um, but I think also where we are now isn't easy for most people. Um, and there are real consequences of inaction. So, so I think other things that, that we can do as a society, as communities, as individuals are like, you know, first center the people who are most impacted, put them at the center, phase out fossil fuels, invest in clean energy at scale, legislate, regulate, 
vote. <laughs> we all got to vote. Um, and let's innovate, you know, like let's find ways to prosper that aren't at the expense of people and planet. We we can avoid these these tragic trade-offs. We can avoid these false choices we've been given. And I think, um, you know, hard things are hard. <laughs> it's not going to be easy. Uh, but I, I do believe we're better than this and we can figure it out. For people who might be at the point that you were at uh, a while back and and feeling inspired a call to like this is this is what I want to devote my time and energy to how how would you recommend for people who want to get in involved in this space or who want to who want to lead positive change yeah yeah um I'd encourage people to think about sustainability and the clean economy much more broadly it's not just um, rooftop solar and EVs um, with, with our climate careers externships at Rising Sun, we look at all different roles and in industries, engineers, researchers, construction workers, techies, policymakers, consultants, organizers, all the things. Um, and that can be at a nonprofit, at a for-profit, at a government agency, you know, in government, labs, all, all of it, right? Um, we all have skills that can be applied to this space. I have my undergrad in English, <laughs> that's it. <laughs> um, so all of these skills are needed um, and because eventually there, there isn't gonna be a job um, that doesn't touch or isn't touched by climate. Uh, as we're nearing uh, our close here, is there is there one sort of big takeaway or message that you'd like people to, to walk away from this conversation um, in, their, in their minds? Yeah, well, hope, hopefully the importance of job quality is coming through. The um, thinking about workforce development more broadly and inclusively, understanding the connection of climate to all the things and, and, and thinking through that lens. And when it comes to Rising Sun, reach out. You know, I love hearing from people. I love talking about these things. And, and I'd love for folks to visit our website, learn more, donate, ask questions, all those good things. Final question that I always ask all of our guests um, is uh, looking back over the past now three plus years since the start of the pandemic and and all that we've been through and all of the the, the challenges and inequities that have been exposed and all of the, the suffering um, in all that, what what have you seen that has left you with some hope for the future? Mm, yeah, thank you for that question. Um, this will probably have be a long answer. <laughs> uh, we, you know, we have we have a practice of um, celebrations and appreciations at Rising Sun, so this this fits like right into our wheelhouse. Um, one thing. Uh, that I believe in is lifelong learning um, and people's ability to both learn and unlearn. I've done it. I'm still doing it. I think that's a real gift. Um, and, and it does give me hope. Um, seeing people do that, seeing those transformations. Um, and then, you know, I'm so lucky. I have a lot of things in my life that that lift me up every day. My, my nine-year-old daughter, Ranger, my husband, Joff, our goofy dogs, <laughs> the beautiful place we live. Um, there's the team uh, I work alongside at Rising Sun. I mean, they are just so truly awesome. They, they care deeply. They're really good at what they do. They're fun to be around. Um, yeah, they they make it happen. They make a difference. And then, um, and then there, yeah, then there's the work I get to do every day. So you spend one day with our youth participants and you will have hope for the future. If you spend a day with our adult, our participants, you'll be inspired. Um, so I, I just feel, I feel grateful every day to have found this work. Well, uh, Julia Hatton, CEO of Rising Sun Center for Opportunity. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for sharing your your work and your experience and your your outlook and uh, and thank you so much for the work that you do every day to make the world a better place. Thank you. It's been really great to be here. Appreciate it. Mm -hmm.